here to our research institute on the harbor to explore some interesting, dynamic, and inspiring topics. So we really hope that you enjoy tonight. Before we get started, I'll do a quick introduction to GMGI. I know there's some people that know us well and some people that might be a little, a little bit newer to the organization. So my name is Logan Walsh. I'm the development director here at GMGI. And our mission is to address critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. And we do this uh, using a triad, a strategy triad. Uh, here at the Research Institute, we um, have established a marine biotechnology institute that is powered by genomics. For many of you that went on the tour or have been on the tour in the past, you've, you've seen and heard about some of the impact and some of the ways that we use genomics to look to the ocean for new discoveries and new ways to care for our ocean environment. Uh, up at Blackburn uh, Industrial Park is where we have the Gloucester um, Biotechnology Academy. And this pillar is really to create 
a vibrant science learning environment where we can train local high school graduates to, uh, to be professional lab tech workers in the Commonwealth's booming life science sector. Um, if anyone has not been up there, talk to me or another staff member and we'll ensure we can give you a tour of our uh, learning laboratories at the Boxer Lab Technology Academy. And then lastly, we have science community. This is really to promote the conditions that will encourage the development of a science hub here in Gloucester. One thing I ask everyone to do when they come to these talks is think about how you can help GMGI and help by spreading the word. Talk to your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues about what you saw tonight, what inspired you, and that will then help us grow our network. Next year, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. And it's amazing we've been here for 10, 10 years, but we've got that far because of the people that have supported, have supported us and helped us grow our network. Follow us on social media, so Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're putting up lots of uh, fresh and exciting, interesting content that you might enjoy watching and sharing. It's another way to help us grow our network. And if you feel inspired and you want to make a donation to keep our academy in this uh, research Institute thriving, please speak to me or my colleague Maggie, I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, almost everything you've seen has been built because of the support of our donors. Many of you are here tonight, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. Uh, and uh, we'd love to welcome more people into our community of supporters. Okay, so to get right to the program, I want to introduce tonight's speaker. So Andrew Martinez has been diving and photographing green life for 50 years. His New England field guide turned popular, um, and then the mobile app, uh, which is called Marine Life of the North Atlantic, has become a necessary resource for anyone wanting to know about marine animals in our own backyard. And he has authored two books for young readers, including Don't Mess With Me, The Strange Lives of Venomous Creatures, which offers a peek into how sea creatures defend themselves and another uh, book titled Peer at the End of the World, which uh, we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Andrew has been on a photo assignment sponsored by National Geographic magazine, which have taken him to Fiji, Bonaire, and Cape Cod, and his work is currently used in many other nature books and field guides, uh, as well as exhibits in most of the aquaria in the United States. Um, he's led marine biology studies and travel groups in the Philippines, Indonesia, and the islands of the Caribbean. And this November, he was leading a dive trip to Cuba to explore the marine national park gardens of the Queen. Tonight's presentation will introduce you to the colorful and diverse world beneath the New England waters. Andrew's many years behind the camera will provide us with a view of the varied and unusual marine life of this region. Uh, which will be, and also we'll be discussing the interesting behaviors, interrelationships, and natural history of the Gulf of Maine creatures. We will also hear from GMGI's Jennifer Flinsky, who wishes she could be here in person, but is unable to, so she's going to give us a virtual presentation. Jen is a senior research associate here at GMGI. And then after Jen, we'll hear from Matt Harkey, a uh, research scientist um, who will uh, talk about how we're using marine genomics to look at marine microbial discovery. With these three speakers, I think you're going to have a really wholesome picture of the incredible diversity just out, out, our, out these windows in our own backyard. And with that, I will turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. First off, thank you for a more than generous uh, introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm thrilled that this is a, a topic that I love. And so to be able to present it here with a group of people who are interested in this marine life, um, for me, it's a treat. Because we all know, and we'll hear more about it tonight, that it's a very, very rich area. Rich because um, we know there's a long uh, history of, of fishing, but the richness begins with the rich plankton uh, quantity in, in the waters here. Now, 
that's wonderful for the food web because that's the, the basis. So that creates what we have. And it's also the downside of that is we don't get the visibility. So the water is green, not crystal blue. And uh, it appears to be uh, lightless or dark. Because if, if I would tell you how many times if I'm getting ready to, to die someplace along Cape Ann. And there's two questions that I get asked every single time somebody comes by. Of course, number one is, have I seen a shark yet? <laughs> That's for sure. Then they say, in different variations, but it's always, do you see anything here? Is there anything out there? And, uh, and that misconception has to be, you know, because they, they are, their experience is either at the beach, where the waves have just churned up the, the water, or you're in a marina, same thing, gets churned up, or you're looking dark, looking over a, a pier, and it's quite dark. But it's the opposite is true, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes. And I guess the two things to keep in mind when you're looking at these images is one is that everything except for I'd say three photos, everything was taken from diving from shore. So I didn't know expedition that was mounted to go see these things in the far reaches of our of the Gulf of Maine. Either I'm diving off the beach or I'm diving off the rocks, someplace in the Gulf of Maine, primarily uh, Massachusetts, Cape Ann, and then uh, up into Maine. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, most of what you see was photographed, my camera was no more than a foot and a half away, probably mm -hmm. a foot, or in many cases, six inches away. So if you contrast that with, you know, observing or photographing birds or live mammals in the United States or any place, you need, you know, binocular spotting scope or if it's a camera, you need long, long lenses. None of that's useful underwater. And as long as your body language doesn't look like the till of the hunt, you can approach animals very, very easily because they watch your body language. And if you appear low key and then gently approach, you can get unbelievably close to, to animals. So let me begin. So the, these are the first of just a splash of color. Just to let you know that this is offshore. Again, you can see this uh, lost or rock all the way up the coast. These are northern red anemones about the size of a soccer ball. And it's it's a, anemones are related to corals, soft corals, hard corals. So they have tentacles all around the edge of the, and then armed with stinging cells and then a mouth in the, in the center. So it gathers its food, brings it into the mouth and, and feeds. And you can see the variety, it's all the same species, but just a, a wide variety of, of color. But I'll begin to really uh, with, with fish, because everybody knows fish. Mm -hmm. And if you look at fish, look at a fish, you can tell a lot about the fish. For example, when you see this striped bass or a school of, of pollock, see this streamlined, narrow head, and it's a very streamlined body. So immediately you know that it chases down its prey. So it's a fast moving fish. When they have large eyes, like this uh, Acadian redfish or rosefish, you can tell it's a nocturnal fish. So especially twilight time, uh, when there's just a bare amount, of, a barely uh, small amount of light, they can actually they can hunt easily. So in the daytime, they sort of hang out under a ledge or close to the rocks, and then at night come out to feed. And the same with like this silver spider hake. A white spotted egg. Also has a largish black eye, but it also has these appendages which are like chemo sensors. So we can grope around in the dark because it comes out at night and then touches and finds its food that way. It's not a tactile, but it's more the, the, the chemo sensor so we can taste the, uh, the potential food. 
And this is another fish, like this is a short horn scalp, very common fish here. And they uh, can blend in to the bottom, but they're part of a huge umbrella group of fish that are called ambush fish. And they ambush their prey because they're too slow to chase them down. <laughs> so, so this one blends into the rock with the rocks. Uh, even though this one is a little more colorful, it has a little bit of color like the other set of the rocks nearby. But if you look at them, these are all short horn sculpted. You see the large head and then it narrows down to a tail. It's not chasing anything here. So it, what it can do, and the same with its cousin, the uh, sea raven, they can move and jump six, seven, eight inches like lightning. Um, matter of fact, you wouldn't even see it. I mean, there have been a few situations where, uh, like this particular situation, I saw it lining up a crab. And so I thought, well, this is pennies from heaven. So I was lying down in front, everything all set to go. It was over before I knew it. And you know, I'm real slow. But it, it just was so, so fast. So it pounced on this. Uh, the crab fought hard, almost got away, but then eventually the uh, sea raven won. But the point with this is that it's, it's, it's speed in the first seven or eight inches. Afterwards, it pretty much just waddles along. And then the, the goosefish, which uh, also is another animal that lives on the bottom, and another name you may know it as monkfish. So the goosefish gets its name because it can eat geese. Uh, I, mean, I know that's a, an oddity. I mean, they don't fly through the air to get the geese, but what they'll, they'll be in very, very shallow water and could be a foot. Uh, and because they're very, very flat. Yeah, yeah, come on. Sorry. 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 So, number one, you can see the very large mouth that it has. It has a huge mouth, small teeth, but a huge mouth. And so when they're in that very, very shallow water, that's very calm. Um, first of all, I should say, those of you that walk along the beach and stroll in the water, you will never see this. This is only in that water when no one is walking around. Um, and so uh, we've all been sitting on the beach and... You know, maybe it's a cold day and you see the ducks uh, come close to the, almost at the shore, but maybe eating the algae or whatever, or mussels on the bottom, but they come very, very close because there's no one there. Well, when they come over this, it just leaps up and inhales it. And one specimen, when they caught it, they opened the stomach and there were 13, one, three, 13 ducks inside. It's pretty impressive. They can get to be six feet. Well, I know. But this was this was probably two and a half feet or so. And other animals that are on the bottom. And I, I really love spending part of the dive on the sandy bottoms just to see how animals adapt to it. And so this is a, a winter skate. And there are different skates that we have, but when you see a skate with those two white spots on the on the wings, that's definitely a winter skate. Now, in the daytime, they oftentimes will cover themselves with sand, just sort of hide there for a while. And then at night, which is when they prefer time to, to feed, they'll come out and you can see their eyes open up to adapt, to try and get any kind of, uh, uh, to, to utilize a little bit of light that's available. And so then they just move along and feed. Now the torpedo ray, uh, another name for it is electric ray. It also can be close to six feet. And what it gets, it's an electric ray because it can release 220 volts. Um, so it uses that defensively and offensively. So def offensively, it will just get on top of something, stun it, and then feed. Uh, it has a small mouth, so that's why stunning it is, makes it, uh, an easy way to, to feed. 
In the flounder, this is probably at this time of the year, there's probably six different species of, of flounder, but this is the winter flounder, which is here even in the winter. And it has the ability to change its, its color. When it's in a background that's a little dark, it becomes dark. When it's in one that has a lot of uh, broken shells, then it incorporates, and it's all done, uh, it, it incorporates all of the shells, color, or the white patches all over its body. And this is at night, and it's feeding on a, a clam worm. And the window pane flounder has the name window pane because it's very, very thin. It's not anything you would ever catch to eat because it's as thin as a window pane. And there are a lot of visitors that, I call them visitors, that come in the summertime. Just as we have um, birds that migrate here in the spring, and in the summertime we have a lot of birds that are normally in the south. Well, these are, this is a, a pipefish. You can see how it's related to the seahorse by that kind of a funny head. So they here, they come usually in June and last until the beginning of October. And then there's, uh, these also are summer visitors. This is a puffer, a northern puffer. So it will expand. Normally I see a couple of these a year um, in, in the northern part of Cape Ann. And uh, you know, either they're lying on the bottom or they'll swim a little bit, but they're, they're kind of low key. Two years ago, there's a, a, a time that uh, the divers called it the puffer palooza because there were <laughs> puffers everywhere. I mean, in, a, in this, an area the size of this TV uh, monitor, there would probably be 40 or 50. Wow. And, you, and I, I was, I don't know, maybe a foot and a half away. And they're just like a bunch of kittens bumbling over each other, trying to come over to take a look. Uh, they're pretty cool. So that, that's one of the things that it's the, I find fascinating because it's, it's not like a zoo, number one, that you can depend on what you're going to see. And two, you never know what it's going to be there. What animal normally is not found there but is, and now in, this, in that case, in, in huge numbers. The black sea bass also comes around in the, in the summer more prevalent uh, Cape Cod cells, but around up here, it's usually the, uh, spring and summer. And this little guy is probably an inch from here to there, and it looks like a little tadpole, and it's called a snailfish. So it sucks onto a rock, and wraps the tail around itself, and it makes it almost impossible to see. Here it stands out because of the, the flashes, but. Uh, it's normally a little difficult to see. And then this a year and a half ago was the first time I ever saw this. This is a, a smooth dogfish. I'd seen spiny dogfish before, but never a smooth. So I was pretty psyched. So I, I'm lying down and I wanted to get a few more pictures of it, but there was a big rock to my left. So I couldn't I use, I used two strobe lights. And I couldn't get the second one in, in position. So I was inching my way over. And I'm saying inching because I did not want to scare this fish because it was just lying on the bottom. And you see the lobster in the background. So I was thinking, well, this is great. I have a little lobster in the background. <laughs> well, the lobster came up, pinched the shark, <laughs> and the shark left. <laughs> And then there's animals that are uh, like the radiated shanty that will take care of its, its young. This is a male, a female, which is about the same size. They're probably seven, eight inches long. So the female has laid a massive amount of eggs. Her job's done. She leaves, and then the male will stay there until the eggs hatch. So this particular bunch was moving along. And the same thing with the lumpfish. Uh, the female laid those eggs, those orangey, uh, that orange mass on the left. She laid the eggs, and you see the holes like that. She swims in circles, depositing the eggs. And then the male will stay there and uh, protect the eggs. Either, most often, you see it 
facing the eggs, but this case it went right on top. And it has a, some modified fins that here that are, um, they, they form a suction cup. So it will actually stick right to the rock. And uh, sort of a fearsome looking, but kind of low key. This is an Atlantic wolfish. Pretty big teeth, but when it's out in the open, it's very docile uh, and actually timid. But when it's in its den, then it's, it has some pretty fearsome teeth and will eat urchins uh, like potato chips <laughs> because it has a fused plate in the roof of its mouth so that when it just crushes them. And there's a, a pair that's been around for a little bit in their den. So I said that, you know, pretty docile. When they're out in the open, they'll swim away from you. But when they're in their den, it's not anything that you want to bother with. And a harbor seal, and as the years go on, we see more and more of these now. So now this group or this phylum, uh, that's beginning now are animals, they're echinoderms, is the, the name of the phylum, and they're sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, that's all in the same group. And then uh, the Gulf of Maine, we have a lot of very colorful ones, and this is a, a very common sea star, uh, the northern sea star and the Forbes sea star, uh, quite a color variation, very pretty, um, and uh, but this is how they feed. All, most of the sea stars feed this way. They have these two feet. Now, it's not that they're ripping open that clam that's there. It's they'll pull, and just like a hydraulic system, they'll just apply a pressure and hold it. And they can hold that forever. Now, the clam, to keep the two valves together, is using its muscle to keep together. So eventually, muscles get tired, and then it opens up, and then the sea star feeds. And then, because well known, their powers of regeneration is pretty amazing. It can be, they could reproduce four of them as long as one arm is there. And luckily, you know, in the springtime, you're lucky to see them uh, spawning. So they'll, these will get up on sort of, I guess you'd call it, get up on their toes and release, this one's releasing sperm into the water. And down current, the domino effect begins. So others sense that they'll release sperm or eggs into the water. And the fertilization takes place in the water column. Now, it seems ridiculously haphazard, but it's the most common sea star. So it works. There are others uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, I say deeper here, but up in, uh, way up in the main. It's much shallower water, but this is a common, uh, it's a smooth sun star. And they're about the size of a basketball. And they wide color variations. That species and this, the spiny sun star, both real, real predators. So enough so that if, if you picked up this and, you know, you look at a sea star, we've all seen sea stars in tide pools. They're not real active. If you take one of these and just touch it to the on the on the sea star, the sea star becomes turbocharged and it just takes off because it knows if it doesn't move, this one will eat. So they can sense it. Here's a, a bad star, this is right off the coast here in, in Gloucester, and a horse star, or in other words, a hoss star. <laughs> And this is a fairly common sight, um, the sand dollars. This is actually in Folly Cove. Now, a few minutes on invasive uh, species. This green crab, uh, been around for a while, but it's definitely not from here. And those of you who may have seen in the Globe, I think two weeks ago, there was an article about how the soft shell clam has been, their numbers have been dropping, and they're thinking that it's this crab that's really uh, raising havoc with them. 
although I did hear a couple of weeks ago that there was a whiskey that they're making from this. So, <laughs> so it's a possibility. Uh, and then even more so is the Asian shore crab. If you're along the shore, uh, especially south of Cape, Cape, southern part of Cape Ann, and all the way to Beverly, Marblehead, you low tide, turn over a rock, and you'll see five of these. It really uh, just exploded. And then there's an uh, invasive creatures. This is a tunicate. It's called common uh, compound C square, and it covers the rocks. Uh, covers lobster traps, lines, buoys, uh, certainly just all over the bottom. So first reaction for some, they say, well, if it's on the bottom or covering a rock, big deal. Well, a lot of the animals that we have, they have a, a larval stage. They cruise around for as a, in the larval stage for a few weeks to a month, and then eventually settle down, adhere to the bottom, and then begin to grow. Well, the real estate's been taken by this fast growing. I mean, it grows so fast when it has no place else to grow, it grows outward. So you can see all of these uh, appendages growing because it just keeps growing very quickly. Is that is that invasive? It is, yeah. And I saw one, uh, this was in Lane Cove. Lane's Cove, uh, it was a, a lobster in there who was cleaning his traps because it was absolutely packed with this. So he had this big tank that was running off his engine, uh, the hot water, and he would just dip the, the whole trap in there, kill this tunicate, and then it was clean and began. Mm -hmm. Pretty good system. Wow. And there's a shameless plug. <laughs> uh, so uh, the app has, you know, it's a, it's a it's like a field guide, but it's on steroids. It has all kinds of creatures and uh, all these little dots mean there's more pictures of the moon snail. So moon snail fe feeding, mating, digging in the ground, laying eggs, so on and on and on. So whether it's uh, invertebrates or fish, um, it has quite a bit and it's something you can just put in your pocket. So if you are interested in this, it's through uh, Apple Store or Google Play. Now the moon snail. So that's the first of this next phylum or group. This is the mollusks. So the mollusks that we have here commonly, commonly are gastropods or snails and bivalves like clams and mussels and even uh, the cephalopods, the squid, which are starting to be in big numbers now. So the moon snail cruises along. Now, those of you that walk along the beach, I'm sure you've seen this uh, moon snail, but you may not have seen this large foot, because when it's up on the beach, that foot gets compressed into the shell. But in the water, it uses that, that large foot to plow into the sand. And so here's a, a pair of mating on the fly. And then they are, this is the, the this here, it's called a sand collar. And that's the egg case of this. So the female extrudes this ribbon of, uh, it's made up of uh, egg yolk and sand. And then it just stays there until the eggs are developed and hatch. And then, but in the meantime, another snail, the three-line whelk, will lay its eggs on top of the other eggs. So all of what you see here are the eggs. So it's kind of funny that you know, one snail is laying the eggs on the other, neither one knows, neither one cares. And the cephalopod, this is a, uh, this squid uh, is real common. I was diving yesterday and uh, in Poly Cove, there were three or four masses of, of eggs. So this is where they come here uh, come up to the shallower water to uh, to breed. So here's a, a male, which is the larger one on the bottom, holding the female and uh, begin to, to mate. Where well, the male will deliver a, a packet of sperm to the to the female. And then eventually, eggs like this. And so each of these sections are like your pinky. 
and it's loaded with hundreds of eggs. So in the beginning, they're pure white or yellowish, and as time goes on, they turn brown and then uh, ready to hatch. If your heart is beating a little faster, this is our state mollusk. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, it has a few names, wrinkled whelk, Neptune whelk, Tenridge whelk. And in the springtime, it will lay eggs. So it lays this pile of eggs that each little purse is loaded with yolk and then uh, embryos. So the embryos consume the, the yolk and then each other and the strong ones will chew out a hole through the side and begin life as a miniature adult. Now related to the uh, snails, or gastropods, is this animal called a nudibranch. Now the land or terrestrial equivalent is the slug like you have in your gardens. They're not attractive. Uh, but the nudibranchs are, and there's many different species here, uh, and I just spent a little time with this one. This uh, the, is called, a, well, the flabellina is the general genus. There's a bunch of different kinds of flabellinas, and what they do is they eat the stinging cell of another animal. So here's this one cruising along the top, and it's eating these little hydroids. Hydroids are related to uh, corals and anemones, so they have stinging cells. But the, what I find the fascinating thing is that it will it eat. So these are, they're feeding on the stinging cell. They encapsulate it, so it goes from mouth to stomach, and then it pushes the stinging cell in these little appendages, appendages called serrata. So now, essentially, it's armed itself with the defensive stinging cell of the animal it just ate. That's a pretty cool system. Then the bivalves, there are some bivalves like the scallops who prefer to be on the sand. And there's others that prefer to be in the sand. So here's a, a surf clam. So it sticks its foot out, plunges it into the sand, pulls itself down, and then it does that in a series of motions. It pushes down further, pulls down again, until eventually it's completely covered in the sand. And the only thing that's there at the level of the sand would be just the siphons on, on top. And horseshoe crab. So now we've got to another phylum. These are arthropods, and they are joint leg and creatures, which means they can walk. So I saw one of these yesterday. Uh, normally, the big time for these is um, May and June, because what they do is, this is there, I mean, regularly when they're around it, digging through the sand, you can see tracks all over the place. But what they'll do is, they're not mating here. The male is holding on to the female. He has specialized claws that clamps on, and he's there for a week or two. <laughs> and because when she comes up, and it's all it's the high the high tide of the full moon in May and June, she comes up out of the water on the beach, lays the eggs, and now he, who's had a, a ride for a little while, he will uh, externally fertilize the eggs. So she's buried him, and then he fertilizes the eggs, and, and it's. Not uncommon to see two or three males all attached <clears throat> to, the, to the female or to each other. So it's a long uh, chain. What do they eat with the horseshoe crabs? Uh, small mollusks. That's what they're digging for in the sand generally. Now, I know the marine life here fairly well, and I came upon this guy, and I, at a distance, I wasn't quite sure what it was. So the closer I got, and I realized. It was a hermit crab that uh, didn't have a shell. So I swam over to a place where I knew there were a bunch of shells, put one over, <laughs> jumped in. So then I tried. A couple of months later, I saw a larger one. This is up in Maine. And this is an Acadian hermit crab um, and didn't have a shell. 
But just for a second here, you see the way the body is? Curls like that. So that's like your pinky. So if you were going to hold a shell, that's how you hold it, right? So you would stick your claw, your pinky in the, in the shell. That's the only attachment it has to a shell. It isn't connected at all, so that's why you're not supposed to gank them. Uh, but anyway, I saw it. I brought two or three shells. It didn't like anything I presented, so <laughs> I left. Then uh, on the way back in, just before I came back out of the water, I went by to check and see what was going on. So this is the test, or in other words, like the shell of a, a skeleton, if you want, but it's called a test of, a, of an urchin. Very fragile. Uh, poor choice, but I, <laughs> but I asked it was a lot better. So there's the Acadian hermit crab again. And a rock crab. There's a couple of different species of rock crabs. Uh, so the, the much oh, a few weeks ago that you saw this very common with a bright orange egg mass. As the eggs begin to mature, then they turn to a, a brownish color. Uh, this is actually a Jonah crab, but same thing. They both do the same. And so what she is doing is she is using her feet and plus appendages that hold onto the eggs, squeezing the eggs like crazy, because all of these dots that you see, that's the larvae. So it has um, caused the eggs to hatch, and then not uh, just by the, by the thousands, there's uh, larvae. And we all know what northern lobster is. And they're real scavengers. So they feed on anything on the bottom. So there was a dead surf clam. So they, for some reason, there were a lot of them in that area. So they were just having a, a field day. And this one must have fallen off a, a boat, a discarded uh, its skate. So it was feeding on that. And eventually, they'll get to be the size of this behemoth. So when they're big like that, just will stay in, in a little uh, crevice or big crevice in this case, and then just stay there. It's easy to defend. And the my absolute favorite and one I love to see in photograph is this little guy. It's probably an inch. And it also, like the lumpfish, because it's related to the lumpfish, has a, these fins here form a suction cup. And so it will just stay there. And it has, it's been given the name Spiny Lump Sucker. Terrible. <laughs> so it's not a great name, but it's a cool little fish. I mean, there have been several times where I'm taking a picture of it. Now, I'm, my camera's probably six inches away, and it jumps up on my camera and then just looks up. <laughs> and I move it back on the rock, and another time it jumped on my wrist and just stayed there and looks up at you like a, like a puppy. So they're, they're cool little fish. Now the absolute last shameless plug. Uh, this is the, I was very lucky to work with author, the author Paul Erickson, the friend. And he, um, actually he's the science uh, person now in that, I'm sure you're familiar with the Cape Ann Cosmos newsletter. And so does the, the science work for that. And that's a fabulous newsletter for, for what's happening in the art world and, and science, too, in Cape Ann. So anyway, this book is for young readers, and you know, 7 to 12, and it's a, a whole day cycle of what uh, what's going on at this old pier. And so the little vignettes of stories about uh, marine life. And that included this, you can see what kind of a camera it is it it's a it looks more than what it is it's a regular camera that's inside it's just in, in a an aluminum case and you have to and two strobe lights <laughs> i should mention that the strobe lights if, if i the quickest way to explain this if i took an, a red apple brought it down to 30 feet the apple now looks brown if i bring it up the surface it's red I bring it down again, take a picture with, with strobe lights, it brings out the real color and it looks red. So that's why strobe lights are, are, are pretty important. 
So the last few here are just little scenes of, um, of this area. And so it's a close-up of a sea star or well, some tunicates. Another nudibranch again. There's all sorts of just little beautiful little scenes. The sugar kelp. The winter and early spring, and that's the prettiest. And the, even though it's yellow, it's all green uh, sea hair. And a lot of jelly-like creatures. This is a comb jelly. A lion's mane jelly. One looks like from Space Wars. It's related to the hydromedusas. And then the anemones that are, live in the sand, instead of adhering to a rock, they just burrow into the, their column, it goes into the sand, and then they just extend tentacles to feed. Close up a winter flounder. It's a young hake hiding under a, a sand column. Another anemone, very small anemones, are lined anemones. So if you're walking along the, the rocky shore and encounter like tide pools, or you're in a very shallow, low tide area, and there's a little bit of water, it's worth just stopping, walking around, if you're, especially if you're with a, a young kid, just experience that with them to show them that you can find all sorts of things even if it's a very shallow amount of water here, little shrimp, little crabs, little sea stars, and tide pools are uh, a gold mine for, uh, for everyone. So anyway, thank you. Thank yeah. you. So at this time, uh, we're going to switch over to Jen Blinsky's presentation uh, virtually. And then after that, um, Matt talks, we'll do uh, questions. So if you have any questions, just hold on and we'll do them all at one half again. And just maybe some additional context. So Jen is going to talk about kind of. Hi, everyone. Yo, Jen Kalinsky here. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person today. I was so looking forward to the opportunity to co present with Andy because when I moved to the North Shore and started working at GMGI about five years ago, all of my experience with marine biodiversity and species identification was tropical and subtropical. So one of the first things I did when I got up here was purchase a copy of Andy's book, Marine Life of the North Atlantic, which I have my copy right here. And it was the beautiful photos that I saw in this guide and later that I saw in the app and the beautiful photos posted by other members of the local dive community that convinced me that Maybe these New England waters weren't too cold to dive in. Now I dive year round and would staunchly argue that New England diving is just as beautiful as anywhere else in the world. I even do a little bit of amateur underwater photography myself. It's not nearly as incredible as Andy's photos, but I did sprinkle a few throughout this presentation. But I'm not here to talk about my diving or photography. What I'm very excited to talk to you about, even just virtually, is marine biodiversity from a slightly more scientific standpoint and how genomics is a really powerful tool that we're using to study and understand it. So we spent the beginning of this talk with Andy really focused in on the Gulf of Maine and its beautiful inhabitants. Now I'd like to take a step back and look at our planet as a whole. From this angle, we can see some land, but most of what we're seeing is water, the oceans. If we let the Earth rotate a bit and look at it from another angle, it's even more clear that our planet is an ocean planet. So it's not surprising to learn that 80% of the global biodiversity on Earth is found in our oceans. But how much diversity is that really? Just in terms of animals, in the animal kingdom, there are 15 animal phyla found on land, but 34 found in the marine environment. That's more than double. But again, what does that really mean? So you've heard the term phylum, or it's plural, phyla, quite a few times already, I think. 
And it's a bit of a scientific term that some of you might not be very familiar with. So I'm gonna give you an example of what kind of diversity just a single phylum can contain using humans as the species example. In science, we love to group things based on how closely related they are evolutionarily with species being the most specific grouping, um, kingdom being much more broad and the most broad being the domain of life. Our species is Homo sapien. Here's a little Homo sapien as an example. And the first part of that term, Homo, is our genus, the next step up from species. We're currently the only extent species in our genus Homo, so the diversity there is still one. Going up a level from there, our family um, includes seven other species. These are the great apes. If we move up from there to our order, primate, we're now at over 300 species. As you can see, the more we move up, the more organisms get grouped into these classifications. Going to our class, mammalia, it's all the mammals, over 6,400 species. And we're seeing a much more diverse cast of characters here. Finally, we get to our phylum, chordata. This phylum includes everything with a backbone, mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds. But it also includes a couple things that you might not expect to be grouped with humans and other vertebrates, like the lancelets or tunicates, which you might know, uh, be more familiar with as sea squirts. These are still in our phylum. That's a lot of diversity, and it's only one phylum in the animal kingdom. So to say that the ocean holds 34 animal phyla is a really incredible, almost mind-blowing amount of diversity, and that's just looking at the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom falls within the eukaryotic domain of life. It's just one little branch right here. And in addition to eukaryotes, there are also the prokaryotes, the bacteria and archaea that we often don't think about, except in terms of maybe bacteria that can cause infections. But these tiny organisms are hugely important for the functioning of our planet and for life on Earth. So our planet's biodiversity is spread throughout this tree of life, and 80% of it can be found in the oceans. Hopefully that's convinced you that the oceans have a lot of biodiversity. So I guess the next question might be, why should we care about it? It's offshore, out of sight, out of mind, right? Wrong, I wouldn't be here talking to you about it if that was right. Life as we know it relies on the oceans. We receive endless benefits from the sea. Many are listed here and I don't have time to go through all of them right now but I like the way that Dr. Sylvia Earle once put it. With every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea, no matter where on earth you live. We need to care about the biodiversity because we rely on the oceans and biodiversity is key to a healthy ocean ecosystem. More biodiversity means more productivity. It means more resilience and more adaptability. That last one, adaptability, is more important now than ever because our oceans are changing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about climate change. I'm hoping that I don't need to convince anyone here or that's tuning in that climate change is real. What I will say is that our oceans are taking the brunt of it. They are our planet's incredible buffering system and they've absorbed most of the excess carbon and heat in our atmosphere. And we would be in much worse condition if they hadn't, but there are consequences to that for the oceans and also for us. So this is where I'm finally gonna zoom back in here to the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf of Maine is an incredible ecosystem. It supports active fisheries. I shouldn't have to tell anybody that here in Gloucester. Um, there's more marine mammal diversity in the Gulf of Maine than anywhere else on the East Coast of the United States. And it also contains rare cold water coral reef ecosystems that we didn't even know about until 2015. We're still learning new things about this beautiful marine ecosystem in our own backyard. But what we've also learned is that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. 
in order to understand what that change means and how it's going to affect our ecosystem and everything that relies on it, including us, we need to know what's there, what's below the waves in the Gulf of Maine, so that we can tell when and how it's changing. So there are a lot of ways we could do that. Scuba diving, underwater photography, and visual surveys are one way to document biodiversity. But from a scientific perspective, there are challenges and inherent biases associated with visual methods, as well as any other method. First off, we cannot dive everywhere. There is a limit to how deep we can go with a scuba tank. There's tech diving that lets us go a little bit deeper. And once that doesn't work anymore, we've got subs and remotely operated vehicles or ROVs that can go much, much deeper, but they're also much, much more expensive. But putting that aside, where we can go when we dive with scuba or subs or ROVs, there are still other drawbacks. We're limited by our field of vision. We can't see everything. Um, we can't see the stuff that hides when a big scuba diver or sub comes its way or the stuff that swam away right before we got there. Um, as fishery scientist John Shepard once said, counting fish is like counting trees, except they're invisible and they keep moving. We just can't be looking everywhere all at once even for the stuff that doesn't swim away. Personally, I love benthic invertebrates. So when I'm diving, I spend most of my time looking at the bottom, as you might be able to notice in these photos that I included. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten out of the water and had a dive buddy ask, did you see that school of fish or that shark or that turtle? It swam right above you. The answer is almost always no. I was too busy trying to get a photo of a lobster or a coral or something else on the bottom. And that's just the stuff that we can see with our naked eye. Most of the diversity in our oceans and on Earth in general is too small to be seen with the naked eye or captured on camera unless that camera is part of a microscope. But these tiny organisms are critical to life. Take, for example, the little green cells on the bottom left. These are Prochlorococcus. They don't look particularly exciting, but we rely on them more than we know. This is because they generate an estimated 20% of the total oxygen on Earth. A fifth of the oxygen in every breath you take is thanks to these little guys. Or another example on the bottom right. Those are my personal favorite microbe, Zosanthelae. These are the microscopic algae that live inside reef building corals cells. We tend not to notice them until they're not there. That's a phenomena known as coral bleaching. The corals will starve without their zooxanthellae and that puts the entire reef ecosystem at stake. That's just two examples of important microbes. There are so many more. We need to include these invisible but important organisms in our biodiversity assessments because they're just as important, if not more important, than the charismatic creatures we are able to photograph. They're the nutrient cyclers, the producers, the base of the food chain. We need them to survive, so we need a way to also include them when we're studying these systems. That's where genomics finally comes in. With genomics, we don't need to see any of the organisms that are present to figure out what's there in the community. We can use what we call environmental DNA or eDNA. This is simply any genetic material obtained directly from an environmental sample. That might be water or sediment, soil, whatever. It's part of the environment that the organisms are inhabiting, not actually sampling the organisms themselves. The genetic material in these environmental DNA samples might be tissue, skin, or scales that a fish or a shark or whatever swimming by left behind. It might be metabolic wastes, um, free-floating DNA from cells that have already broken open, or the whole tiny microbes themselves. We can take everything that's in that water or sediment or soil and extract the DNA from it and use targeted DNA sequencing to identify where that genetic material came from. We have methods that are species specific. If we wanted to know, for example, was there cod in these waters recently? We also have less specific genetic markers that allow us to say, 
what are all of the eukaryotes or all of the prokaryotes present in this sample? So this is actually the technique that we decided to use when we were doing a preliminary study on sediment samples collected from the northwest corner of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So Stellwagen is located in the Gulf of Maine. We have a national marine sanctuary right in our own backyard that stretches from Cape Ann all the way down to Cape Cod, P-Town. And the fact that it's already been designated a national marine sanctuary means that we know it's an incredibly important marine ecosystem. The problem is there haven't been a lot of full scale total community biodiversity studies there. So that's what we decided to try to do. From just some muck that was collected by dropping a grab off the side of somebody's sailboat, we were able to see an astonishing amount of diversity thanks to genomics. We saw some of our favorite cast of characters that we've already seen uh, earlier today. We, these included some crustaceans, a variety of fish species, different cnidarians, mollusks, echinoderms, tunicates, and not just animals, we were able to see marine plants, just to name a few of the big ones that we could have seen had we gone down. But in total, using just sediment and DNA markers, we identified 127 different phyla present in this part of Stellwagen Sanctuary alone. 115 of those phyla had not been previously reported in Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary. And that's because over half of those were microbes. Remember, the microbes can't be seen, but they are just as important, if not more important. So we were so excited by these results that we've since expanded on the study in collaboration with NOAA and the Stellagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary Office. We returned last summer and collected both water and sediment samples along the length of Stellwagen Bank. Um, the samples are currently being processed by my colleague, Jess, who may or may not be here right now. I can't tell since I'm not there. Um, so she's begun the DNA extractions and soon we'll have those on the sequencer and we'll be able to start analyzing that biodiversity data. So hopefully sometime in the near future, you'll all come back and we can tell you all about these new results and I'll be there in person to share them with you. So I know this is an event focusing on New England waters, but I have been asked to talk a little bit about some of the more global work that we're doing here at GMGI in partnership with OceanX. OceanX is a group that has a mission to explore the oceans and to bring it back to the world. And you may know them if you've watched the Planet series. They've done a lot of filming behind that series, as well as some other National Geographic series as well. Um, and in July of 2021, we had this great opportunity to join them on their state-of-the-art research vessel. This is the Ocean Explorer here on their maiden expedition where they were conducting a new program that they launched called the Young Explorers Program, which was designed to bring an opportunity to students from underrepresented groups uh, and ability to go on a research vessel, sail on it for weeks at a time, learn what it's like to be a scientist collecting data from the ocean and what it's like to work on these vessels as well. And in this research cruise, which was both educational, I taught some lectures there as well. So they learned about oceanography and how we study the ocean with genomics. We boarded the ship in the Azores, beautiful islands uh, just off the coast of Spain and traveled north to Norway. And on the way there, we had this incredible opportunity to sample a hydrothermal vent ecosystem. For those of you who don't know what those are, think about uh, Yellowstone National Park and the geysers there. So hydrothermal vents are kind of like geysers, but at the bottom of the ocean. And this particular one was 2,900 meters below the ocean surface. And that's about two miles below the surface of the ocean. So down there, it's very deep, dark, no sunlight penetrates. 
and very cold. It's about four degrees centigrade, so just above freezing. Yet, there's this amazing diversity of life that's inhabiting this very extreme, unique ecosystem. And these hydrothermal events are found throughout the globe, and they're typically found on spreading centers on our continent or our oceanic crust. You can see this crack. And the ocean crust is actually separating apart, and the magma is coming up. Water is seeping down through that crack, heating up, mixing with the rock, extracting chemicals and elements, and then emerging out of a vent. And when it hits that cold, deep water, a lot of that material immediately comes out of solution and precipitates out, and they can form these beautiful columns of material where organisms start to inhabit. And what's interesting is these ecosystems are far and few between. So you might have one in one location, then hundreds of miles away, there'll be another one. You have to host the exact same biodiversity. And one of the big questions we have is how do they do that? How do organisms living here transverse, traverse this massive distance where there's almost nothing happening and then colonize that new environment and grow? And so one of the questions we want to ask is using the capabilities of our partner and their ship to go out in the middle of the ocean and sample these waters and using the, some of the same techniques that we heard about from Andy and explore this new diversity down to bottom of our oceans, as well as our genomic techniques too. And so I'm going to show you next a video uh, that was shot just a few weeks ago by the NOAA Ocean Vessel Okeanos Explorer. And they were inspired to go visit this hydrothermal event again based upon some of the work that we did with Oceanics. And so they took their vessel just a few weeks ago and shot this video here. And I'll just kind of walk you through some of the things that they were able to see. And this, this event is relatively new to science. So it was first discovered in 2013. And it's been visited twice before, uh, three, actually three times if you include us. You can see here's one of those hydrothermal columns, and there's some black smoke coming up out of it, and that's that material uh, precipitating out. It's very dark and deep, and but yet there's life down here, and you can actually, and here's where it is located, just north of the Azores, along that fracture zone. Here you can see some of the hydrothermal fluid coming out, so that's very hot water. Um, you'll see them measuring the temperature in a few minutes here. Here's that black smoke that's coming out, but it's covered in life. There's snails, there's some shrimp. And this, what's driving biology down here is bacteria and archaea, those microbes. And they're doing what's called uh, chemosynthesis. So they're converting chemical energy that's coming out of these hot thermal fluids into organic matter. And these other organisms are then feeding off of that. And in many cases, some of the bigger organisms like clams, and uh, two worms will actually form symbiotic relationships with those bacteria. And, that, and so the bacteria will actually feed them. Here's some more images of the thermal fluids and the cloudy dark smoke. This is called a beehive diffuser. So as the thermal fluid rises up, it forms this near beehive type shape structure. Here's another image of that black smoke. And What's important about these ecosystems is not only are um, they rare and extreme and hard to see, and they're really just fascinating, and honestly, it's on my bucket list to go down and see one. This is the best I've been able to do. <laughs> um, but they're incredibly fragile, too, and they have some very unique diversity. And in fact, some in some cases, there's novel chemicals and enzymes that we might be able to harvest from some of these organisms that are adapted to these extreme environments. And there are examples of that already in play with New England Biolabs as an enzyme that we use in some of the chemical reactions here that it only works at high temperature. And it was harvested from a hydrothermal vent. Um, there may be new therapeutics that we could discover at these ecosystems where they're making new compounds in these extreme environments. And so not only do we need to understand what's there, but we need to protect it and preserve it. Um, with There's increased interest in mining on uh, the deep sea. Um, and we yet don't know how resilient these ecosystems are if one gets accidentally knocked over. Will it recolonize? We don't know yet. And so there's still a lot of work to do. And here at GMGI with OceanX, we're able to get out and ask some of these little questions and reach some of these really extreme environments. And so to try to tie it all back together, we've 
heard a lot about some of the work that we can do coastally, looking at some of these um, important coastal organisms that are really important to our New England waters and our fisheries, and even these small charismatic, I was already charismatic microbes. Uh, this is a picture we, we uh, took uh, on the Ocean Explorer. To the global perspective too, I mean, our ocean is an ocean planet. It's covered by 70% of the 70% of the planet is covered by oceans. Um, and these oceans are very deep, in some cases over 10,000 meters, so like 33,000 feet. Um, and they host an amazing amount of diversity, but yet we've only explored about 20% of our oceans. And so you can only imagine like how much more diversity is still out there yet to be explored and understood. And by through these opportunities, we can train the next generation of scientists to really help preserve, protect, and advocate to protect our oceans because um, they're so vitally important to the function of the planet as well as our livelihoods. Um, and with that, I'll end and I hope you can take some questions because um, this has been, a, I think, a really inspiring session today. Uh, I wish I was still diving. I haven't done it since 2007, but hopefully <laughs> I'll get back into it. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Andy, you want to come up? I'm sure there's a lot of questions about your stuff. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, I, I have a question about the biodiversity uh, that you guys were uh, looking at as still in the day. <clears throat> How long does like the DNA actually last? Because you got two currents, like the Labrador current and the Gulf Stream. I mean, could all that biodiversity, I know it's still it's rich, but could how far could like DNA travel to the current system? And, and wouldn't that like, you know, be, you know, I mean, you couldn't really say that 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 that, yeah. that, that, that organism is actually living there because it could have been transported hundreds of miles through currents. Yeah, so that's why that's kind of one of the challenges of using eDNA in the environment because you have to take into consideration the currents, the temperature, what other organisms are there that might degrade the DNA. Uh, was it a super sunny day? Because solar radiation can degrade DNA. What, what level in the water were you taking that sample? Um, so what we've been thinking about a lot is how can we combine eDNA techniques with other more standard methods that are used so that we can verify that our measurements are correct, uh, but also uh, looking at the physics and how water is moving, uh, looking at what other biology is visually present when we're taking that sample. So even what sampling techniques do we use? Is there, there can be biases with how we filter the water or how long it takes us to put it into a freezer or how we preserve it, et cetera, because DNA does degrade over time. Um, so these are all things that I go and they wonder consideration when we design those studies to do that. But it's at the same time a really useful tool with all those caveats because it gives us that glimpse of things that we can't see or things that are more transient that have moved through the system. They may not be there anymore, but we know that they were there at some point in time. Um, and that's can be important information to have, especially for things that we can't see either through visual methods or through some of the surveys that we do when we're looking at diversity out there, such as trawl surveys or other types of things like that. Another just quick question for Andy. How, how, your, your pictures are beautiful. Thank, Thank you so much for sharing that. So, Thank you. Um, what, what is the, the biggest change you've seen in your diving career? Like, you know, so that was, was, when it's something that you, you worry about. <laughs> so the question is, you know, what is the the biggest change that I've seen, or and what I worry about, it's definitely change. Um, for a while, I was thinking that it was just me sort of compressing history, you know, and you're thinking, well, I used to see 10 or 20 of these, when in reality, it may have been three or four years of, of span, a span of three or four years. But there's definitely a, a decrease in, in, in fish. Certain species of fish you just don't see as much, and then I, I see a lot of the and I don't don't know why um, algae covering the bottom, uh, covering the rocks. Uh, some I guess could be whether it's us being uh, a little too eager to fertilize our lawns and 
that's working its way in and the nitrates going into the water or just and or uh, global warming where it's the waters are definitely warming up because I would very often go away in the summer for the whole summer and then when I came back and started diving again in the spots that I had been all spring you know it was always a change and for me it was always the the September look where everything was just covered with uh, the rocks were covered with a with a brown algae, but now it's I see it in April. You know, it's just mm -hmm. covered the water. So, I, but I don't know. Maybe I'll address that better than I. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's kind of yeah. Could be all those factors. Years ago, on Windy Sheep Beach, there'd be hundreds of washing pools, hundreds right. all over the beach. I think we saw over the last couple of years maybe one dead one. And I'm just wondering what has happened with horseshoe crabs. Like it, we, two things. One, definitely the numbers are, are decreasing. Um, I know there's, uh, because it, 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 it's important. It's important for the whole ecosystem, but there's birds that depend on those eggs when they lay the eggs. Um, birds that are migrating from the southern part of South America and going to the Arctic. That part is definitely happening. Um, but it also could be, I don't know, are you going during the time, during that high tide of the full moon? We're usually on the beach walking along during that time. Okay. And I'm just thinking that there used to be, you could find hundreds of them on the beach. But it is, it is that, because um, they have it timed, Right. Uh, and it's the high tide here a couple of days afterwards, but full moon, May, June. Then you don't see them on the beach. Right. Uh, but the numbers are definite. I know there are some states that are prohibiting them from using the, the, okay. the conch. People are fishing for conch, use it for bait. Um, some states have, have eliminated that, but. Uh, yeah. And then there's a, the whole thing where, you know, it's they, they use the blood for. Uh, for medical uh, uses. And so you never know, well, I don't, certainly don't know, where the truth lies. Is because some say that it's they're going back, being re uh, returned to the ocean, maybe too late. Maybe they're sitting in the drum in the back of a truck too long. So maybe the survival rate isn't there. Or it's just maybe a coincidence. But, but the, the numbers are definitely uh, smaller, right? gone a few times down to Cape May, which is the, the epicenter uh, of when they just come up in, in droves. Mm -hmm. well, the difference is, is huge. I remember going, my wife and I went years ago, they were all over the place, but the last bunch of years, it, 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 the numbers are down. I don't know if that answers your question. But it's all right. Is there any information about why these species such as the green crab uh, are suddenly here is it environmental or well pollution it, it's or what? well they, they they've been coming for a long time yes and the ones that have been came a long time ago we think they're normal just like the uh, common periwinkle it's not from here but it's been around so long that it's now part of the uh, the ecosystem but they come, most of the invasives come by uh, in the ballast water of ships. It used to be just attached to a, a boat, you know, but it was slow moving, and now it's the ballast water. So that by rights, they're supposed to dump the ballast water in the middle of the ocean and then refill and then come here. But if they dump it here, then what you saw earlier some of that plankton, well, that they have captured when they're filling up the plankton from another region, it gets dumped here, the animal begins to grow, and there is no natural predator for that animal in some cases, and then they just go crazy, uh, breeding the water. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Yeah, we have time for one more, and then we'll... Okay. Yeah, I was just curious, going back to like your, um, some of your research, which is it, So the question is, uh, 
with our genomic techniques, can we get a population densities um, are just what's there and what's not? Is that right? Okay. Um, I would say yes for both. Um, for with eDNA um, and you know some of the points that were brought up um, by someone else here, it's hard to get exact numbers. Like I can't tell you how exactly how many fish are in that water based upon a sample of water, but I can tell you a relative abundance um, that there's likely more fish in that population in that sample than over here. But one thing that's hard about that is a fish could swim and um, drop a bunch of stuff, and we actually happen to catch that. And that's just one fish, but it's a lot of DNA. And so that might bias our understanding of it. But we have other genetic techniques where we can actually start to count how many are in there um, by looking at markers for individual organisms. And we're developing some of those newer techniques to try to get at population densities in the environment and where they're occurring and what time of year they're occurring, et cetera. Uh, still a relatively new field, although we've been using genetics for decades now, but applying it to the environment and some of these big questions is, is relatively new and cutting edge at this point. So, yeah. Well, thank you everyone so much for listening to these incredible talks. Please stay, have some more food and drink, mingle. Uh, we hope to see you next time here. Let's give all of our speakers a round of applause. Thank you.